Dear colleague, welcome to this PCR webinar on TAVI entitled From the First Valve to Lifetime Management and supported by Boston Scientific. My name is Thomas Cusset. I'm working in Marseille, France, and I'm very happy to do this uh, webinar today with Lisbeth from uh, Halst and with Holly de Becker from Copenhagen, Denmark. So, the learning objective we'll try to discuss and to achieve together today during these uh, 60 minutes will be first to select the most appropriate THV device for the index TAVI procedure and also to share tips and tricks for optimal TAVI outcomes, keeping in mind the lifetime management. And finally, to reflect about the best technical option for redo TAVI. Indeed, we are nowadays treating younger patients with longer life expectancy, and we have different options, including surgical ones and interventional ones. And of course, all these options will make different combinations. And regarding that, I would like to start asking you, Lisbeth, what is the current situation as of today in 2023 regarding the, the option of surgery or TAVI in patients with severe aortic stenosis? Yes, um, uh, thank you, Thomas. So uh, for the moment, our most recent guidelines we have uh, are the European ones. And there they actually um, um, make the difference between patients uh, aged uh, below 75 years old and that have a low STS score. Those patients need to be treated with surgery while patients aged above 75 um, or patients with high STS score should be treated with um, transcatheter devices. Now, for the American guidelines, this is different. So there they will treat patients aged 80 or older anyways with TAVI. Patients uh, aged 65 or younger, they will receive SAVR. And the whole group in between, there it will depend on um, life expectancy of the patients, expected durability, and other patient factors. Now, this is interesting to see the next graph. Um, these are data from the TVT registry where we can clearly see how TAVI is being adopted in uh, contemporary practice. And um, in patients aged eight years or older, we can see um, that um, almost all patients are treated with TAVI, and this hasn't changed a lot since the last five years. But specifically in the age group of 65 until 80 years old, there has been a significant increase in uh, the adoption of TAVI in this patient group. And also, even in patients uh, below 65, we see a significant um, increase in patients treated with TAVI. So these data tell us that, in fact, in real, in real life, um, younger patients are being treated with TAVI. Yeah, thank you, Lisbeth. So it means that when we start TAVI 15 years ago, it was a, a one-shot procedure, but now we have to think about the index procedure, but also to have in mind that this patient might need a second one between 10 and 15 years later, especially when we treat patients of 65 or, or even 70. Uh, maybe you can help us to try to identify what are the key aspects related to this concept of lifetime management that we see everywhere nowadays regarding TAVI, meaning what we should really focus on. Yeah, so this, this success of TAVI has been uh, built on the fact that we have um, so good acute results. Uh, procedural success is high. Uh, we have um, techniques has evolved, uh, the technology has evolved, and we have now very low rates of paravalvular leakage. Uh, we aim to reduce pacemaker new pacemaker implantations and also have um, good hemodynamic results. But what we need, we need to do the same for the long term. So we need to um, um, we need to um, ad, ad, um, change technology, we need to adapt technology, and we need to adopt new techniques to also not only have acute good results, but also in the long term result. Yeah. Thank you, Lisbeth. So it's exactly what we say. So we have to focus, of course, still on the optimization of the acute outcome but also to try to optimize the, the long term because nowadays TAVI candidate, they have a long term mm -hmm. because they have longer life uh, expectancy. And maybe could you go a little bit deeper in uh, one of the, of the key aspects 
of this long-term management, which is the, the, the commissural alignment? Yes, um, it looks like commissural alignment will be a cornerstone of this whole lifetime management um, um, idea that we, we now need to implement in our daily practice to have later on uh, even as good results. So what about commissure alignment? So just to explain first, um, on the left you can see here that the commissures of, this, uh, of the bioprosthesis are um, similar as the native commissures of the patient's anatomy. On the right side you can see there's a complete misalignment. So the commissural posts of the bioprosthesis are hanging in front of the coronary. And this is um, a study uh, where they looked at historical TAVI and surgical patients and they, they checked how often do you achieve commissural alignment. And of course in the surgical patients it was virtually every patient had commissural alignment because the, the surgeon takes the valves out yeah. and places the new one just similar in the similar fashion and has his eyes on the valve. Now for, for TAVI this was really different. In 50% in of cases of TAVI patients they saw that there was moderate or even severe commissural alignment. So a big group of patients um, that has not um, this specific uh, anatomy. Now, if we want to have commissural alignment, there's three things we need to know, actually. First of all, we need to know where the patient's native and anatomical uh, commissure is laying when we do the procedure. Second, we also need to know where the bioprosthesis commissural post is. And third, how can we match both of those? So first of all, if we want to know the patient's uh, native anatomies commissural alignment, we have to go back to the S-curve that we know from our pre-procedural planning. And here you can see on the grid that you have this S-line and you know on every point on this S-line um, the three cusps will be coplanar. If you go here in the middle, in the center, uh, to the green dot, you have the well-known tree cusp view where the three nadir points of the sinuses are nicely separated from each other. When we travel then to an um, uh, areocaudal view, we go to the so-called uh, right-left cusp overlap view. And here, um, the right and the left cusp are on top of each other, so we know that the commissure in between both is at the right side of our screen. Those are the two um, um, uh, views that we will use during implantation. But it's also interesting when you travel up towards an iliocranial view, there we can have the right non-cusp overlap view and where we will separate out the left cusp knowing that the left coronary artery will be in the top right of our screen. Of course we know the LAO, LAO view from engaging coronaries. Eh? When we engage the left coronary we also do it in this fashion. We have uh, our self-expanding valves and there are some markers um, that tell us where the commissures are um, uh, located. And there have been developed different methods for different types of valves to align both. So this was, uh, for example, investigated in the Comaline study, um, where they were able to uh, reach, eight, in 88% of cases, um, mild or less commissural misalignment. In the cases where it was not possible, this was sometimes driven by the fact that they couldn't really see the markers on the, um, on the bioprosthesis, or in some cases this rotation was difficult to um, perform within the patient. But for example, in the Accurate Neo 2, in this study, they saw that commissure alignment was possible in 100% of cases. Yeah, thank you, Lisbeth. So it's interesting to see that when we start TAVI, we even did not mention or having in mind this kind of concept of commissural alignment. And we have improvement of the technology and we have larger indication. And now we try to, to optimize things and to, to think about the, the long term. Maybe before uh, seeing a case and to see really practical applicability of, the, of this concept, I would like to ask Ole, because you, you did not speak yet. So uh, just to know regarding what we discussed about the, you know, the, the big change in indication. I know that in Copenhagen, you probably did one of the first all commerce a study, mm -hmm. and what is the current situation regarding, you know, the repartition between surgery and, and TV in younger patients in your practice, Holly? Yes, I would say, of course, we have these European guidelines. They put really a line in the sand to say if you're 75 or older, you go to TAVI. If you're uh, younger, you go to surgery. I think it's not that black and white, of course, and binary in, in clinics, of course. And 
I would say if I look to the practice indeed in Copenhagen, it is true that 95 to 100 percent of patients older than 80 they go for sure to to Tavi. 75 to 80, we're also there at 85 to 90 percent. It's only very few patients, sometimes because they need some uh, other uh, bypass surgery or uh, they have the primary mitral valve disease or, or sometimes it's a hostile bicuspid that they still sometimes end up in, in surgery. But that's very few patients. And then we still already take quite a big uh, part of patients actually also in the age group of uh, 70 to 75. And that are multiple reasons. I mean, um, it can be because the patient is, is extremely uh, obese, he has a lot of other comorbidities this, which disqualify him for, for surgery. So in that sense, I think we are indeed moving already a bit further than what the Euro official European guidelines uh, tell you to do. Yes. Yeah, if you agree that this cutoff of 75 sounds sometimes a little bit artificial. And do you also face in your practice, we have that almost every week, patient of 70, 72 mm -hmm. arriving in the center, not for assessment of aortic stenosis, but for TAVI, because he, he's seen on Google or he had a relatives who had a TAVI and he said, no, you will never open my chest because I know you can do it uh, in two days and uh, that's exactly what I want. Sure, I mean, patient preference is also mentioned, by the way, in the guidelines officially, yeah. and that also plays a role. But that the, what I think is key here is that you make your assessment and you, you consult almost your patient on the decision based on what you see on CT. Yeah. I mean, a lot is to do about that. And that's the new model, I think, where we have to go to a hearty meeting. You cannot have a proper hearty meeting discussion about the patient if you don't have the CT data. So this is now an obligation in Copenhagen. The last three years, a patient will only be discussed at a hearty meeting when we have a cardiac CT on him, our, every severe aortic stenosis patient. That means even patients from 50, 52, whatever, the, where you almost say this is automatically going to surgery, even our surgeons found out that this is really useful information. They find out, for example, it's a very small annulus, I will have to do annulus root enlargement, or this may be a uh, porcelain aorta. So we don't end up in these situations where they open up the chest, they close it again and call us like, yeah, I'm yeah. sorry, we can't do it. So I think that's a shift in change in mind. And um, I think that's the new model we should implement is having cardiac CT on these patients, having that information in the heart team meeting and then make a decision based on that. So you mean we can go in younger patients if the anatomy is favorable for, for TAVI regarding the access and the valve as well. Yeah. So it's interesting that we have the feeling that now in most of the patients with aortic stenosis, TAVI is the first option mm -hmm. and we will do surgery when really there is and a favorable anatomy like a complex calcified bike speed, yeah. no femoral access. So we yeah. completely uh, change the yeah. paradigm compared to 10 years True. ago, probably. But then indeed, this session is important because there are some aspects to take into consideration when you are going to do a TAVI on a 67 year old, or you, ha you have to consider other aspects. Uh, which we discuss here, yeah. the, having the best hemodynamics possible, commissural alignment, uh, what, what about, about the durability of the valve choice, choice you make, what, what about, about what we're going to discuss on in the, at the end of this session is more like what are revalving options. So you have to think already a bit into yeah. the future, which you don't necessarily do if you treat an octogenarian. It's yes. valve implantation and preparing the future. I, I know we will discuss a little bit later about redo TAVI, but maybe let's come back to the, to the first valve implantation and the index procedure, procedure and, and regarding, regarding the applicability of this concept of, of commissural alignment to, to optimize the, the index procedure. Elizabeth. Yes, so well, I'll present you a case. So this is a rather young lady. She's 72, 72 years old and she has severe AS with symptoms of uh, shortness of breath on uh, mild exertion. Um, as her comorbidity, she has had a prior stroke and she is known with obstructive pulmonary disease. Um, on her echo, she has preserved the action fraction, so it's a normal flow, high gradient aortic valve stenosis. And on her angio, she did not have any significant coronary artery disease. In her labs, we see uh, preserved uh, kidney function, but we do see some degree of anemia. And so this lady had a CT done. Um, we see here an uh, analyst with a perimeter of 72 millimeter, perimeter derived diameter of 23 millimeter. LVOT is slightly bigger. And here we can see quite large sinuses uh, ranging between 28 and 30 millimeters. And when we travel through the aortic route, we see clearly a tricuspid valve with mild to moderately uh, calcified, quite symmetrically um, calcified leaflets. So coronaries are uh, relatively high at 14 millimeters in this patient. And for access, we do not expect um, many difficulties. There's no, almost no tortuosity and calcifications are, um, are little. So 
this patient was then discussed in the heart team and she was uh, actually proposed for transfemoral TAVI in local anesthesia um, using uh, the ICELI 14 fr French expandable sheets and also using sentinel cerebral uh, protection device. Um, in this case, we are going to do a pre-dilatation with a 20 millimeter balloon and specifically in this case we chose for an accurate uh, NEO2 valve, in this case a medium-sized valve, and of course um, with the implementation of commissural alignment. Yeah. Thank you, Lisbeth. M maybe we, we, we can stop here because as you said, hello, probably we, we, we can implant different HV devices, uh, but there is some specificities. Mm -hmm. But before going to the procedure itself, uh, we've seen in this case it's young patients, uh, let's say moderate or probably uh, even less calcified tricuspid valve. Yep. In your practice in Copenhagen, how do you select the good THV device for, for a patient yep. with aortic stenosis? Yeah, true. We have all different devices available to our availability on the shelf. So, um, well, I would say first and uttermost, it's like two thirds of our patients are suitable for any valve type. Yes, I think that's that's fair to say. Uh, one variable which is really important, which let it be eligible or not eligible for one or the other valve, is the size. That's the first thing. Some some valve types do cannot serve these very large, uh, larger annually. But then besides that, if you look then zoom into accurate NEO2, for example, I think this is, for example, uh, we know it gives extremely uh, little pacemaker, uh, single digit uh, pacemaker rate, a very uh, small rate of uh, conduction disorder. So if you have a patient at risk with a P prolonged PR, right bundle branch block, it's uh, if eventually, then this is uh, could be, for example, something that pushes me to one or the other valve and accurate NEO2 could be a good choice there. Also, small anatomy is then, on the other hand, at risk for patient prosthesis mismatch. So also there you want to go for a valve with, which gives you the best valve hemodynamics. Typically these are the valves with the, the superannual leaflet position. Also deliverability of a valve can uh, be cons uh, have consequence on your choice. So also accurate NEO2 is very deliverable, I'd say. Also in very horizontal aortos, it really le leans itself very nice in that outer curve just so you can have a, get a really good implantation of the valve. And then I think, Historically, I think most were um, yeah, associating accurate NEO with it's good for these kind of, as the case uh, Lisbeth showed, like mild to moderately calcified valves. And I fully agree that's a great choice. But now with the accurate NEO2, with that uh, external ceiling skirt, that ac active ceiling skirt on it, I think we also use it for severely calcified cases and with great outcomes with very, very low PVL rates. Yes. So you mean the skirt and PVL reduction thanks to the skirt of uh, accurate NEO2? Yeah. Uh, probably move a little bit the indication and you go to more calcified yes. uh, aortic stenosis. Yeah, that's thanks not the limitation to the, anymore. The skirt yeah. and, and PVR reduction. Yeah. Also regarding the, the procedure is that we, I've seen on your slide uh, that um, you do predilatation. Is it routine practice for all cases when you use uh, accurate NEO2 or it's again, as we said, for the patient selection, is it tailored based on the CT? No, for accurate NEO2, I would say virtually every patient we would do pre-dilatation, except for patients with uh, pure AR, for example, or in valve, in valve procedures. But apart from that, almost every time we do a pre-dilatation. Okay, I think it's good, good yeah. and, and practical. But then going back to this case, you <coughs> presented 72-year-old patient. Uh, again, there you want, it was not the, the largest anatomy. I mean, it was a perimeter of 72, 73. So you want to avoid patient prosthesis mismatch. You want to maintain good coronary accessibility. So you want to go for a type, uh, valve type that offers yeah. you this. Yeah. And also regarding it's, it's a young patient, meaning it's not bicuspid, but uh, the plan is to use cerebral embolic protection device. And there is a big debate in the last few years about the use. Should it be selective? Mm -hmm. Always, never. No. Uh, we had recent evidence. So what is your view on that? And what is your, also what is your practice, of course, uh, in yeah. Copenhagen? No, good point. I mean, that's a difficult discussion. I mean, we all know the, the data, of course, of the protected tower study, which was uh, negative. Uh, on the other hand, it was negative. It did not show a significant reduction of the, the overall stroke rate, but it did reduce the, the rate of disabling stroke, these major strokes. And that's what you really want to avoid. So I think there was still an important signal there. Also, if we look in these earlier, uh, more methodological studies, then you see that in every single case, uh, it really reduces the yeah. number of MR uh, brain lesions. So in this session of, of lifetime management, I think it could have importance definitely for these patients with a, a longer life uh, left still that you, you protect them the maximum you, you, you can. And then going to the how I use it now in, uh, in Copenhagen, I think 
I try to use it really based on my, my experiments and, and, and also on, on gut feeling and, and, and healthy uh, decision taking. Um, I, it's true it comes at an economical cost, so I'm not going to use it in all my cases. Do you have a reimbursement in Denmark? for No, it's different. no. it's different. We get a, a certain DRG sum for the entire procedure and, and we can co could cover it for... Yeah. Uh, but still, there are some rules to respect. So um, I don't think we, we do not use it in 100% of cases, but I use it in younger patients, bicuspid patients, valve and valve patients, very severely calcified cases. I do use it. I want to give that protection to my patients and I want to prevent these disabling strokes. That's what I want. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. And probably we have to wait also for the larger ongoing study like the, the, the UK trial. Yes, yes. And we'll see with yeah. probably meta-analysis, with protector, what it will bring. Because you see, that's, that's the point, the difficulty about if you have an, an, an event, uh, let's, let's say stroke, what you want to prevent, yeah. but you have only a baseline incidence rate of 2-3%, it's very hard to show for any device, even if it's, or, or any therapy, even if it's successful, yeah. to even get a significant reduction. You will need studies of several thousand of patients, yes. It's and just then thrombosis. Story that That's we had the same as central yeah, yeah. yeah. So you need these thousands of patient studies. The UK trial there, uh, maybe in a couple of years from now, hopefully gives an answer on that. Yeah, hopefully. Just one word, maybe before going back to the case uh, on this specific point. What is your your practice in HALST regarding the use of cerebral so we, protection? Yeah, so we do not have any reimbursement. So it's really yeah. in selected cases, unfortunately. Maybe if the data come, our reimbursement system will change. Yeah. Who knows? In many years. Yeah, hopefully, let's see. Yes. Um, okay, so um, let's go to the procedure. Yeah, so um, as we do in every uh, pre-procedural planning, we uh, check first the angles that we want to work in. So here we define a uh, right-left cusp overlap view and also a three-cusp um, coplanar view. Um, this was uh, a case that we actually performed a few months ago in Copenhagen with uh, uh, Dr. Gintas, Biljauskas and Ola and myself. Um, so here you can see the setup. So we have uh, primary axis in the right femoral artery um, and we already uh, crossed the valve here and you can see that we had a peak to peak gradient of about uh, 50 millimeters of mercury. Um, in this case, we also had the cerebral protection device. This was through the right radial artery, of course, and then we had secondary access through the left um, femoral artery. Here you can see that we do the pre-dilatation. Uh, we use uh, pacing on the wire uh, to do this in this case. Um, and then after this, we will take the valve. So we take out the balloon first, of course. Um, we perform this procedure on the Safari extra small wire. Um, and here you can see that we take um, our uh, accurate valve. And you can see actually that we point the flush port downwards at 6 o'clock. So yeah, we discussed a lot about commercial alignment. So can, can you please share with us and of course with people connected with us today, how do you practically do commercial alignment during the procedure? To, to increase the probability to have yeah. good commissural alignment and make, as we say, the, the future of the patient and yours sometimes easier. Yeah. So first of all, already um, in, um, introducing the valve with the flush port at 6 o'clock, almost in 8 out of 10 cases, you almost have commissural alignment the moment that you um, uh, are uh, um, at the valve. Now, just to show you for specifically now for the accurate new, um, we can identify the commissural posts here um, and below each post there is a free stent strut. So this means that when we are in the right left cusp overlap view, we know that this um, commissural post, there needs to be one commissural post at the inner curve and the two at the other two at the outer curve. And an extra check here is that this free stunt, uh, free uh, stent strut is, um, or the wing, they also call it, uh, is pointing uh, towards this um, side to the right side of the screen. So when we go back uh, to our case now, um, we are um, advancing here the valve. For this, we go to the LAO view. You can see uh, the Sentinel device there. We nicely cross the arch. There is no interaction with the no, device. No, there is no interaction here. <coughs> so now we will um, go closer towards the valve. And as you can see, we went now to the three cusp view. 
And we will zoom in now where you will see that we have the three commissural posts actually already laying apart from each other. So this is already very promising um, in terms of commissural alignment for this patient. Um, next, what we'll do is we go to the REO caudal, the right left cusp overlap view. And again, um, you will see closer now that we have the, the commissural, one commissural post at the inner curve and two at the outside, at the outer curve. And again, this wing protruding towards the right side of the screen, meaning this resembles uh, the commissure between the right and the left cusp. So, okay, we're happy now about the rotational aspect and now we will look at the depth, of course, for implantation. And for this, we inject contrast through our secondary um, access pigtail. Um, we're quite happy already with the depth here, so we start opening up um, knob number one. First of all, we open up until we see the upper crown opening up. And when we're still happy, we'll just go further, um, advancing, the opening further knob number one and the stabilizing arches are open now. We check once more for depths. We're happy with the depths. So after the pin is removed from knot number two, very quickly, we open up now the valve frame itself. And then we retract our safari wire and slowly we will remove uh, the stand holder and um, its nose cone. As you can see here. So this is going out now. The safari wire is advanced again. And next we do some checks. So we do an angio, but we also do hemodynamic uh, check. We can see that there was no gradient and um, good separation. Now you need to be quick because already now they are engaged the left coronary artery. So this is a final check that they're used to do in Copenhagen. And here you have to see we are in the left LEO view. So this means that the left coronary is now at the right side of the screen and you can nicely see that we have a good window where we can engage the coronary and also that the alignment is actually quite looking very good in this patient. Voila, this is the injection of the yeah. left coronary. Mm -hmm. That's nice. Thank you, Lisbeth. It's a, it's a beautiful practical example because it's good to discuss about the concept and to try to understand what it means for today and for the future of the patient. But it's nice to, it's even better to see how to do it practically. Do you do that in, in your cases? Meaning when you have a commissural alignment and you, you aim to have commissural alignment, at the end you just check that uh, access to coronary is well, on uh, is easy. only already you can nicely um, assess commissural alignment. Of course, if you want to be 100% sure, or you, need, you would need to do a CT. But um, we don't do in every case a coronary engagement. But we do check have we you, done well. You check on the X-ray whether yeah, you are in the LEO view and in the right uh, and in the REO view as well. We discussed with Ole, so finally, two main things with Accurate Neo2. The main is probably the skirt, which reduce the rate of PVL and probably increase the possibility to do a more calcified and more complex anatomy. And also to have the dot, which yeah. compared to Accurate Neo, makes the valve positioning much, um, much easier. Yeah. So, but here, Ole, we have the feeling that uh, commissural alignment is all about coronary access. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure you see uh, other advantages of commissural alignment during the first and uh, index procedure. Yes, I think so. I mean, um, if we can get uh, maybe a, s a small slide on that, uh, showing some of these aspects. So I think, first of all, of course, coronary access is one important point. Uh, maybe let's try to get the slide on. Uh, yeah. All right, so coronary access, that's important, and that's an obvious one, uh, because you don't want to have a coronary a commissural post of your TAVI valve just in front of a coronary osteum. It's gonna complicate your whole intubation yeah. and engagement of the coronary. The second one mentioned there, if you go clockwise, coronary flow, coronary filling, we do not have strong evidence for that. It's more the theoretical aspect that, of course, the, the filling of the coronary is in the diastole, so that's in the closure of the lid, that's why the, the leaflet's also closed, because there's some return flow in the aorta, that the, the flow uses that leaflet as a kind of a ramp to kind of fill the coronary. If you have just a commissure in there, it's, you lose that. There's no evidence, uh, strong evidence for that yet, but that's a theoretical aspect. 
There is some evidence, although, that uh, you, if you have some com severe commissural misalignment, you have more risk of a small central leak, and that's because the co-optation of the valve is just the best and the fastest if you can get that valve implanted in with commissural alignment. There's some data on this. Also, the, the valve performance of these valves is better if you can implant with commissural alignment. And actually, there is some data now, uh, which soon will be published, specific for this Accurate Neo2 platform. So it has some particular external ceiling skirt because it's actually three bigger bags on the outside and then some smaller bags in the middle. These bigger external ceiling skirt bags, they are actually at the, at the position of the post, of the post of the Accurate Neo2 valve. So if you can let this match with the native commissure, where you have highest risk for PVL, then you have the best function of this, this external ceiling skirt. So that's what we actually also show in a, in a, in a cohort of almost a thousand patients that you have, if you have, if you can avoid com severe commissural misalignment, that means if you have commissural alignment or mild or moderate, that's still fine. But if you have an implant with accurate Neo2 with severe commissural misalignment, you do not have the optimal functioning of the external ceiling scourge. You don't make use of it maximally. Also, what we also showed there in that 1,000 patient cohort study is that if you can implant that the accurate Neo2 with commissural uh, alignment, that means that the commissures of that accurate fall into the commissures of the native valve, you get a maximum more expansion of the valve. If it falls together with just the calcified tips of the leaflets, you have a little bit more constrained valve and your gradients will slightly be and significantly be higher. So it, it has impact on the valve performance as well. Then if we talk about doing Basilica ever maybe for lifetime management in the future, we can only talk about Basilica if at least you have yeah, commissural sure. alignment in your first implant. If you have complete severe commissural misalignment, you cannot even consider Basilica. It's not going to be useful. And then this last aspect is also a really interesting one, I think. The, the commissure alignment position or, or rotation has impact on the stress on the leaflets. And there's some nice engineering uh, study. This is from a, a Southampton, UK group. This is with computational modeling where they actually simulate TAVI valves in different uh, rotations. And they show that if you have a commissure aligned implanted valve, the stress on the leaflets they call it the von Mises stress, this is the lowest. And if you have severe commissural misalignment, the stress on the leaflets is the highest. So this definitely can have impact on the valve durability as well in the future. Yeah, thank you, Holly. So it's interesting because most of the time when you speak about commissural alignment, everybody has in mind, uh, of course, mm. the, the Korean coronary access, but, but yeah. it's very interesting to, to see and probably to, to understand that it's improved PVL, it's improved hemodynamics, it will make basilica Possible in case of redo TAVI because yep. now we understand that we are slowly during this webinar moving from the index procedure mm -hmm. to the future of the patient. And coming back to the, the, the lifetime management concept uh, that we are focusing on today. So we've seen a lot about commissural alignment, but Lisbeth, do you see any important aspect that we have to, to, to look at when we have this concept of lifetime management in mind? Yeah. Of course, by far durability. Of course, if yeah. the valve doesn't yeah. endure, um, then uh, the, then we need to revalve sooner, and this is not um, in the advantage of the patient. So durability is an important topic. Um, more and more data come out. We don't have the, the very, very long-term uh, data, but they are coming slowly. Um, and actually, for durability, one of the things that comes along with durability is, is the hemodynamics of the valve. So if you have um, good hemodynamics, meaning low um, mean gradients over this valve and um, high enough um, aortic valve areas, um, we can hopefully manage uh, a good durability. Um, and here, this is one study showing that we have, have single digit uh, mean gradients over the transprostatic uh, trans uh, gradients. In this case, it was with accurate, um, and that was sustained over five years. Um, and these are some data from a large meta-analysis, including 10 of our um, prospective landmark trials, where they also look to hemodynamics and um, valve deterioration. And actually, here we could learn that self-expanding valves have good uh, hemodynamics, have, have, good, have the, the best-in-class um, mean gradients over the prosthesis, and this actually comes along with a lower degree of structural valve deterioration. Of course, these are, this is a meta-analysis, this is only for five years, but I think uh, um, recently there were some data, very unique data, mm -hmm. on 10-year follow-up um, from the Nordic countries. Yeah, true. That's this data uh, from the 10-year follow-up data from the Notion trial. That's a multi-center Nordic effort with a lot of colleagues in the Nordic and the north of Europe. 
And the unique aspect about this study is that already 10 years ago, they included and randomized uh, very low risk uh, patients. So there's a still a good number of these patients alive at 10 years. That's the typical problem. We don't have 10-year follow-up data on, on, on many Tavivels because we were treating octogenarians with a lot of com comorbidities. So the, actually, the, the, the number of patients alive at 10 years was less than 30, 20 percent. And here, a big cohort is still alive, so it gives more robust data. And this was uh, presented by a colleague of me uh, at the ESC meeting. So 10-year follow-up, you see Tavi again in overall, even from early on, gives better hemodynamics than the surgical valves, and it maintains this uh, nice result up to the full 10 years. Then uh, structural valve deterioration, that's what you want to prevent, of course. This is the pure theoretical definition of structural valve deterioration. You see already that there, of course, we maybe punish the surgical valves a little bit too much because it, it, you already have structural valve deterioration just by having a mean gradient of more than 20 millimeters mercury, which we know is sometimes the case in our surgical patients. So I think it's not that fair to look at this one, but it's, uh, we have a modified structural valve deterioration definition where it's not only sufficient to have a mean gradient of more than 20 millimeters millimeters mercury, but you also need an, an increase of 10 millimeters mercury from baseline to your follow-up point, and this is up to 10 years. And also there, you see, first of all, that the Stavi valves, there's a signal, they, they are they're durable, yes, um, they are at least as good uh, as and keep as well as the surgical valves. And even I would say there's a small signal that there's maybe the durability is superior uh, to surgical valves. So this is a first glimpse into what, uh, what these 10-year follow-up uh, will be. There will come more in the, in, the, in the future, of course. But that's important because you have to know about the durability, as the American guidelines say. You have to look to your life expectancy of your patient and the durability of your valve. So if now there would be a signal that TAVI valves, they fall apart after seven, after seven to eight years, then you should maybe keep on reserving this therapy for your 75 plus or 80 plus patients. But there's no signal whatsoever in that sense. So durability is important. Of course, there's differences according to the patient anatomy, valve type you choose and which combinations, and there you have to use your expertise. Yeah. So it's reassuring data regarding durability of THV device, but still even Notion, which is probably the longer follow-up, mm -hmm. it's 10 years, and we know that, for example, a woman of 75, which will have more than 18 years of life expectancy. So mm. even if at 10 years it's reassuring, it's, it's, pro it's probably mean that we will still face uh, a wave of, of redutavir in, yes. in, in, the, in the coming years. Yeah. So we discussed commissural alignment and uh, durability. Uh, Lisbeth, I would like uh, to have your view also on the issue of conduction abnormalities, which I, have been one of the major uh, point with, with the TAVI, but at the beginning, we say that we are treating, as you say, octogenarian patients, so when you have a left bundle branch block, you say, okay, it's fine, it's 89, but what, how do you see the impact of this conduction abnormalities in younger patients with longer life expectancy? Yeah, so new pacemaker implant, we already know this is not benign, and probably the same for new left bundle branch block uh, conduction disturbances after uh, the first TAVI. So we need to be very careful. We already um, uh, managed to lower the new pacemaker uh, rates, um, depending on new implant techniques, also on the devices. Um, but this is absolutely very important also to watch for that we keep those numbers very low, especially in our young patients. Yeah, and that's where, for example, the accurate NEO2 design is mm -hmm. probably able to lower the, the conduction abnormalities, yeah. and that's another good reason in, in younger patients. So, but finally, any, let's say, bowel prosthesis will have a risk of failure, mm -hmm. either surgical or, or transcatheter. So we might need a, a new intervention, and uh, I'm sure, Holly, you want to, to share with us today some recent uh, insight yeah. and evidence on this on this specific field of yeah. the of the redo tavi and the procedural challenging mm -hmm. we will we will face in the coming years yeah it's a very interesting field i mean revalving as we call it a redo tower there's uh, a lot of research ongoing there's not so much in practice because even in very high volume centers the number of revalving cases is still very low but as you said we will probably see many more yeah. in the near future so before doing uh, talking about it, uh, I want to show one slide more uh, in specific about uh, the re what what terminology are you using? Uh, so let me bring this up. Um, so let's get the slides up. 
And I think I can talk about it like that also if it doesn't work. So then we, we it's a leaflet, uh, it's the nail skirt height that which is important. It's also leaflet overhang, which is a, which is a new terminology. So here you get it. So nail skirt height is an imp is a new terminology. Leaflet overhang hemodynamics. Maybe a couple of words uh, to explain this. Yeah. So what is the nail skirt height? Well, if you have a first Tavi valve in position, you bring in a second one. You're gonna push these leaflets of the first valve to the side. Yes, and you're gonna make, you're gonna prolong that skirt uh, in a way, the length of it, you're gonna make kind of a covered stand of it. So of course that nail skirt height can in some configurations, some combinations go very high and that may compromise coronary access, even a risk of coronary occlusion even. Um, so it's important to keep that in mind that nail skirt length or nail skirt height yeah. is important. Leaflet overhang, that is typically an issue when you go for a short framed valve as a second valve within a tall stand frame valve with super high in a leaflet position, it, you may not cover the entire leaflets of the first valve. And then you will have some leaflets of the first valve still hanging over the, the second implanted valve. Uh, in how much how much that affects the hemodynamics, etc., or we, we are investigating, and also to what degree this is acceptable, is also probably depending on the failure mechanism of your first valve. If you have, for example, a, a leaking, central leaking, uh, first valve, you can probably accept quite yeah. a degree of leaflet overhang, but if you treat that first valve, because it's very stenotic, again, uh, degenerated stenotic stiff leaflets, yeah, it's not enough to just cover 20-30% because you won't be pushing the leaflets yeah. enough, so then you will have to cover maybe uh, more of it, but then that comes at the price of a higher uh, nail skirt height. So you see there's a lot of new vocabularium, I would say almost, you have to get used to uh, if you're into this field of revalving. Also, hemodynamics is important. What is the consequence of putting one valve in the other valve? There's a, there's a lot of interesting research where I'm also part of uh, going on. Um, also, valve expansion. If you put a first valve in the second valve, what is the impact on, on the expansion of this first valve and on pinwheeling? That means the, that the leaflets are not fully opening and get the, the freedom to open, but that the, the valve stays kind of constrained and you get pinwheeling that could have detrimental effects on, on the durability again from that second valve. So there's a really, a really a lot to learn there. And if we go then back to Accurate Neo 2, in this specific slide, you can nicely see that we, there is some consensus in the field that if you have to revalve an Accurate Neo 2, probably it's the best to go for a low stand framed balloon expandable frame as a second valve. And then you find the correct size, and then it's a matter of how high or how low are you going to implant. Typically, this is, of course, um, you need the CT data from your patients, post TAVI CT to make your assessment, what is safe here for the coronaries, how high or low was the ST junction. And then typically it's a range where you where you play in. So here, this on the left hand side on this slide, you see this is the highest position recommended for a balloon expandable implant, the top of the balloon expandable matching to the bottom of the post. That's the highest you should implant, and then you almost don't have any leaflet overhang. The lowest you should go, you should not go lower than the top of the balloon expandable matching to the upper crown. Yeah, so it's that range where you can play with depending on the needs of your patient. And then this is just some illustrations. You see these are different valve types uh, and, and revalving uh, options. This is, I, I would say, for the self-expanding platforms, typically the taller, sta taller stand frame valves, it's probably going to be better to take a balloon expandable short stand frame valve to revalve these valves. Uh, and then you can taper your, your needs and uh, your height with that balloon expandable valve. I think the, here is depicted uh, a balloon expandable and a balloon expandable. I think that probably a self-expanding, such as an accurate Neo2 in a balloon expandable is probably going to be more favorable. Also for, you, you will not have the risk of so much under expansion pinwheeling and you will have more favorable hemodynamics, yes? So you see there are a couple of combinations. This is a low balloon expandable implant in these different valves. This is a higher and of course you see it has impact on, I, we do not have the time to go very in detail here, but it has impact on how high the nail skirt will be, um, how much leaflet overhang there will be. And I think uh, this uh, it's indicated by, by the dotted line there. For an accurate Neo2, if you revalve this with a balloon expandable, even despite for a high balloon expandable implant position, typically it's favorable still for coronary accessibility. We have data on this from bench test work that in 90% of these cases, even in challenging anatomies, this is where challenging anatomies which were 3D printed, bench test work was done on this, 90% of these cases it's still possible to get into the coronaries in revalved situations. 
And in these last couple of situations where it was not possible, if you did a basilica on the leaflets, it was also possible to get coronary access. So that's but important. But then you need commissural alignment in the index procedure. Indeed, right? then you need it. But that we just showed, yeah, of course. showed that it's actually very fairly easy to do this. As in, in multiple centers, in most of the centers, these valves are now implanted yeah. in commissural alignment. And I think that's then, to make it even, I don't want to go too nerdy and too much detail, but then you t I talked about neo skirt height, even talking about neo skirt height, because that takes into account on how, how high or low this valve was actually implanted in the real anatomy, because if you put just an accurate and another valve type on the table, you, you will measure some neo skirt height, but of course you have, you have some nominal implantation depth. So, Accurate NEO2, typically the normal implantation depth is five to seven millimeters. And then if you, I, what, what I indicate here is this is the impenetrable uh, region where you cannot go through with any catheter. If you go in a revalving situation here, despite the fact that the accurate NEO2 has supra and a leaflet position, but you can still have a very low functional neo skirt, even in a revalving situation, even lower than in most other combinations. So that's a unique aspect. You get the hemodynamical uh, benefits of a supraanal leaflet position valve, but because of the way you implant this valve, you will not bring yourself in, in pro trouble in a revalving situation as depicted here in this, uh, in this uh, illustration. Yeah, thank you, Ole. I think it's it's really interesting. Just, just to summarize, so when we will face this situation, mm. if I understand well, I think the main point will be to start by TAVI, meaning yeah. TAVI after the index procedure, and to see really the relationship between the, the frame of the index THV device and the anatomy of the patient. And as you said, because maybe years ago, mm. we implanted valve without Randomly. the concept of commissural alignment. So probably in the coming years, we will face some unfavorable situation yeah. where the risk of coronary occlusion will be very high mm. and we will not be able to do basilica uh, because mm. of commissural misalignment, as we nicely discussed earlier. Uh, so it means that in few cases, probably we will need to bring the patient to surgery and surgical explantation when mm. we did TAVI. 10 yeah, to 12 years before. Yeah, that's a difficult one because, I mean, there are some preliminary data there from the explant tower, of course, which is not uh, favorable, of no. course. Um, of course, it's a mix because many of these patients, why did they get an explant of the tower? Because they had endocarditis, so it was a very high risk population. But still, I think there's, we know too little about the risks of explanting tower and, uh, and also the, the techniques, uh, we, 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 there's still a lot to learn there for the surgeons too. But that could, should not be, that should be something we should avoid. Uh, avoid avoid as much as possible. Yeah. Absolutely, we should avoid to bring our patients into that situation. Yeah, because they have to change also the ascending aorta, so yeah. it's really complex surgery in elderly patients, yes, so exactly. we know the outcome and the mortality yeah. is about 20% uh, yes, at exactly. 30 days, so it's, yeah. it's far, far yes. too much. Let, let's be optimistic, uh, mm -hmm. Ole. Uh, luckily we have Few cases. Huh? Oh, I'm sure it's the same in Hals for you, Lisbetta. We we don't see so many cases, no. but uh, I know that you had already and you had cases to share with us mm -hmm. uh, today. Yep. Really, to to try to go from the concept you nicely described about the interaction between the index THV device and the second one, mm -hmm. and to show practically how yep. to do it using accurate as the first, or maybe as the second THV device. Yep. Yeah, let's do that. That's interesting, and um, and there's some learning aspects on this. So let's go first to the first case. This is an. Uh, this was a 74-year-old male. Um, he got in 2017 an accurate neo implanted. It was an accurate neo, large. He had a good outcome right after. Five years later, he comes back. We see him back, and he's presenting with dyspnea, NEO class three, and he has actually. An, he presented with a severe central leak. Yes, so that was the failure mechanism of this valve. So what is important, I think it's really important that if you have to revalve a patient that you really obtain a post-index tower CT scan. Yes, and on that CT scan there are multiple things, important aspects you have to assess. You have to assess the valve to coronary distance, as most people also know for the classical valve and valve, that means TAVI and surgical prosthesis, but uh, it's more complex than that. I mean, it's also really important to look at the valve to STJ. Uh, distance and that's almost key I would say if to, if you want to know if your coronaries are really in danger of their patient or yes or no the valve to coronary is important but the valve to STJ and how high or how narrow your STJ is that actually determines 
very much how much your patient is at risk for coronary occlusion or coronary inaccessibility in the future. And also an additional complexity here is that in a, in a surgical frame, uh, surgical aortic bypass is a standard frame, typically it's, it's uh, either you sh only if you fracture it, but otherwise it's a, it's a static aspect. So you know what you measure on CT will be that what you obtain. But here, if you put a second valve in, that first valve can also further expand. So you have to also take that into account in your CT assessment. And then here, this is that particular uh, case, so that it was the accurate neo, large patient who came back with the central leak. We then uh, assessed based on the accurate neo that was implanted in the CT we have. These are some, some simulations. You can 3D reconstructions actually based on the CT. Then what would you, should we take as an option? Low balloon expandable implant or the higher implant? You see on the left hand side, that's uh, aligned the top of the in this case, the sapien valve then aligned with the upper crown, which would give us really good coronary access still. If we would go for the higher implantation, we would bring ourselves more in trouble for the coronary access. It would probably still be possible. This was also tested in bench tests. They succeeded in going into coronaries, but clearly it would be harder, yes? So I can show you the procedural um, uh, images. Here first, the crossing of the valve. That's some maybe, I can go into detail there. It's some, some small tip and trick. How you recross an accurate NEO2 valve is doing it with a pigtail. So you go with your pigtail in the top of the accurate NEO2, where the stabilizing arches are, and then with your wire you try to... Uh, it's you to over crossing behind the stabilization yes. arches. It's yeah. to indeed in increase the, the likelihood, likelihood that you will not go outside the stabilizing yeah. arches, because that's a theoretical, and not only a theoretical, that's a real risk if you, to, to do that. So you go with your pigtail in there in the middle and then you recross. Then it's really, really important before you continue that you do a test uh, that you're really through the valve and not tr outside one of the stabilizing arches. And you do this in this particular way. So we call it a swing test. What you do is you go to a fluoroscopic view where you overlap two of the posts of the accurate, yes? That can be any angle, you do it just, you find it out, you can either on CT already mi mimic this, but you, you can do it just on the table. So here you see two posts are overlapped on the left hand side of this fluoroscopic screen, one post is isolated on the right. What I want to be able to see is that if I have a pigtail there with a, with a wire in where I can play that with my pigtail, that I can push my entire pigtail left of the two overlapping posts and on to the right. Yes, that they can pass these two overlapping posts. And if that's the case, you know you're not outside the stabilizing arches. So it's really important. Because if you make a mistake in this, this can have devastating, of course, uh, consequences when you continue with a balloon or a valve. Then, of course, we took our decision. We wanted to go for a lower implant of our balloon expandable valve, meaning the top of this balloon expandable matching the upper crown. Here you see, this is a classical tricuscope plane view, which is typically recommended for a balloon expandable valve implantation. But as you see, I don't know if it's, yeah, here you can see it actually. You see there's quite some parallax in that balloon expandable valve, which is not ideal. We want ideally, if we want to implant this valve nicely in relation to the accurate NEO2, we would like to have maybe no parallax in both valves. Yes, that would be ideal. So what we did is go away from this tricuscope planar view and look if it was better in the, in the right left cuspovular view. And that was actually the case. You see that here, we have no parallax in both valves. So we look, these two valves are now in the same plane and that's ideal. Yes, because if you want to make an implantation, then it's a matter of just adjusting the height. So here the top of that balloon expandable is slightly above still, as you see here, the upper crown. We slowly inflate the balloon here. Now we adjust with this wheel. Now we go a little bit two millimeter down and now it's good. And now we do the final full inflation and it matches, as you see, the top of that balloon expandable matches really nicely, almost in a millimeter precise, the upper crown of that accurate. And then we know, first of all, we have a good implant. There you see there's no leak anymore. So there was, this was a patient with a se severe central leak. There's no leak anymore. He's cured, he's, he's treated. And uh, on top of that, we had within, again, as Lisbeth showed, less than 15 seconds, we could cannulate easily the coronaries. And, uh, and this is in a revalving scenario. So still, in more than 90% of cases, we know from bench tests, it's an easy coronary access tool. So, I don't know if you have questions about this particular case, otherwise I can show also an, uh, another, another scenario, which is also likely, for example, this is an, an, an older patient, 83-year-old male. He had, was treated with a sapin valve, uh, balloon expandable, in 2018. Five years later also, he presents with a severe, not a central leak, but a severe re-stenosis. 
So how to treat this patient the best? Well, here I would say also, as I mentioned before, I think uh, accurate NEO2 can be a really nice choice to revalve short balloon expandable, uh, short stand framed balloon expandable valves, and especially this is a SAPIN 26. So what you have to do, what is really important here is if you do this, if you use the accurate NEO2, is that you see that upper crown, which plays a key role, that upper crown has to be positioned just above the top, the outflow part of that SAPIN. And that's what you see here. You see, you see that upper crown, it's like two small hands, a roughly a centimeter uh, proximal higher than that uh, fluoroscopic marker. You want to position that just above that uh, balloon expandable valve. You kind of ignore this fluoroscopic marker for this kind of type of procedure. Then here you open it. So here the, the, it's already opened, the top down uh, opening. And then you see uh, the final expansion, it, it's a replay. So we have a small push forward on it and the upper crown is leaning nicely on top of the sapien valve. So it's actually rather easy to position this valve. And then you do your uh, opening of your, uh, your stand frame at the bottom. And then what you have is Indeed, this was a case performed by uh, Dr. Uh, Wong Kim Kum in, uh, in Bad Neuheim. So you have a very nice implant, no PVL. Hemodynamics was, by the way, even better than after the first valve implant. So I think even this kind of combination could be even a solution if you have now some patients with, which have some, some degree of uh, patient prosthesis mismatch after a balloon expandable implant and they come a bit earlier back to be revalved. I think it would not be a good choice to do a revalving with the balloon expandable again then you should go for this device which gives you the better hemodynamical solution and hopefully also the more durable uh, result, I would say. So these are two examples. You see, I think um, it's, uh, it's, it's important to know the CT of your patient before you start doing these cases. It's important to know the architecture, the design of these specific valves, knowing where to position these valves and then it's in a way not that hard procedure because uh, you have a very good reference landing uh, repair zone and you don't have to give contrast or it's uh, you, you see the, the fluoroscopic markers of the first valve. Yeah. Yes. No, thank you. It's, I think it's great to see those cases because, uh, as we said with Lisbeth, we have very few cases so far. I'm yeah. sure we will have more and more in the coming years. And I think as you do, you publish a lot on that, but also as we are doing today, I think we need also to do more education and training mm. on this specific yes. clinical issue. We will come in every cat lab in the, com in, in the coming years. And I think that's something we will need really in the PCR activities and yes. beyond to, to emphasize on that. So you mean in the second case, you improve hemodynamics, which is a little bit counterintuitive because we put a valve in a valve, mm -hmm. but it means that it's because you, you transform intranular leaflets to supranial yeah. leaflets in the yes, second case. Exactly, yeah. exactly. That's so right. if you have these kind of, especially if you would have these very small anatomies where you implant, for example, say pin 23 or these smaller balloon expandable valves, they never get to these superior hemodynamics. So if that patient would show up rather early with a degenerated restenotic valve, I think you have to kind of think out of the box and, and try to optimize the hemodynamics. And you can do that with, with a self-expanding valve implantation with, with better hemodynamics. And when you do accurate for the generations of, of S3 in this case, regarding the type of failure, you will do predilatation if it's stenotic. Yeah. And, yes. and if it's if just it's a central failure, PVL, of not, no, you will, if not it's that. a leak, no predilatation. Yeah. And if it's yeah. stenotic, you will do If it's stenotic, definitely. I follow the rule, what Lisbeth said there, in the majority of your cases, you pre are all, all cases, uh, that's my rule as well. Yeah. If I do an accurate NEO2, I kind of like to prepare my landing zone. And if you have a restenotic valve, if it's a native valve or a surgical or a TAVI valve, I will predial it before I implant an yeah. accurate NEO2. Yeah. Very, really interesting. And Elizabeth, in the last few months before closing the webinar, I think it's good also to share practice when we have a few cases. I think we, it doesn't mean that we stop discussing about the index TAVI, but now the volume has increased in all centers. But to redo TAVI, it's, uh, it's still a niche, but it won't last for, for long, I think. In the last year, how many redo TAVI did you have, for example, in, in Alst? To be honest, actually, no, no so, cases. Yeah, but it's a good but sign. It, it's, it's, it's actually the mirror of what we were doing five to ten years ago that we see now. Yeah. 
we were implanting yeah. in patients eight years and older, so of course they yeah, might have died exactly. from somebody, yeah. somebody, something else. And it's actually now that we are changing our practice and, and treating younger patients that we will... That will be in five years. In five years, we will start seeing them in... That's true. In, but in small but you, see the, yeah. Yeah. you see the consequence of what you did 10 years yeah. ago, yes? If you only treat at that time 80 plus patients, it's very yeah. unlikely you will see some. If you already, like we did in the Notion trial, for example, in yeah, the Notion trial more. we have some revelled, luckily a few, but we, we did already treat younger patients, so they sometimes there are some patients we see back. Yes. So Grant, let's be prepared and have a, yeah. a real focus on training and an education on, on this specific, and both from evidence, but also for, from sharing cases as, yeah. we, as we did today. Yes. So I think it's uh, time to, to close this, this webinar on the lifetime uh, management and maybe just summarizing in few words, even uh, a lot have been said. I think when we are treating younger patients with longer life expectancy, we have to optimize the acute outcome as we probably used to do even in, in older patients. But also we have to be prepared for the, for the future because most of these patients, or at least significant proportion of those patients, will need a second intervention. So we have to prepare the, the Reduta V by the commissural alignment, again, by the training and education of the, of the community. So I would like to, to thanks Holly and Lisbeth for your participation. It thank was you, a man. great pleasure for me to do that with you uh, today. And thank you who joined us uh, today. We thanks also uh, Boston Scientific who, who support this, this webinar. And if you were very busy in the cat lab, because we know that sometimes the webinar is challenging uh, in your daily clinical practice to be sure that you have one full hour, uh, it will be available very soon on VOD, on, on PCR online. And also, we are very happy to announce the second uh, PCR webinar supported by uh, Boston Scientific on the 17th of October, which will be uh, dedicated to one issue that we, we discussed today. Mm -hmm. It means the use of uh, cerebral organic protection during, uh, during TAVI. So again, thanks a lot and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you.